Welcome to chapter 2.2, .2, all about water. Okay, so before we start, it's important to get a couple things straight here. Um, we're going to find water all over the place, okay? Uh, we're going to find it in the environment, okay? So it's places where things live. It makes up parts of the environment, okay? Especially parts of the abiotic environment, if you remember that. And it also resides inside living things, whether it be your blood, other body fluids, inside of your cells, lots of important places where we find water. In fact, water is so important that it tends to be one of the benchmark assessments that scientists are using to figure out if other planets are capable of sustaining life. So usually one of the first things that they look for is water okay and we know that water is one of those absolutely essential um, substances in order to sustain living things and that's because it's got a bunch of really important properties that we're going to end up going through one by one all right time to do some drawing here so first thing once you be able to do is to draw a single water molecule there are a ton of ways that you can draw molecular drawings I'm just going to draw water to look like Mickey Mouse, okay? So the big circle is an oxygen, and the little circles are hydrogens. And I'm asking also for its partial charges. We'll talk more about this later, but you should remember from your first biology or chemistry class that the oxygen end of a water molecule has a negative charge, while the uh, hydrogen ends have a positive charge. So then if I'm drawing three water molecules, here's one, and that's oxygen, hydrogen, two, and a third one. Now, within each water molecule, okay, we've got some polar covalent bonding. More on that in a minute. And that results in them having positive and negative charges. When I get um, more than one molecule that is polar, meaning it has positive and negative charges, when I get more than one of those polar molecules together in an area, I can get what's called hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is an attraction between the negative end of one molecule and the positive end of a different molecule. And again, that is called hydrogen bonding. I don't know why it's called hydrogen bonding. I'm sure, well, I hope there's a good reason. But just be careful because the hydrogen bond doesn't go between two hydrogens. Not these two and not these two. It goes between the negative end of one molecule and the positive end of another. Now, when I say that water is polar, having positive and negative ends, okay, that's because each water molecule is put together using what's called a polar covalent bond. Covalent meaning, remember from chemistry, that they share electrons. And polar meaning because they don't share them equally. Okay, that oxygen atom pulls those shared electrons a little bit closer to this, its center than those hydrogens. And because those electrons are negative and they're closer to the oxygen, that oxygen tends to be negative. And because those electrons are farther away from the hydrogen center, okay, those hydrogens tend to be positive. Now again, that's a lot different than hydrogen bonding. Okay, in hydrogen bonding, we're not going to share any electrons. Okay, those water molecules that are stuck together via hydrogen bonding are just stuck together via an attraction. Okay, so those hydrogen bonds, which we drew on the previous slide, um, are just attractions between the positive hydrogen end of one water molecule and the negative oxygen end of another. Okay, and so this is what makes water like very cohesive. It gets its, a lot of its thermal properties, whereas water's actual polarity uh, is very good for its solvent properties. 
Great, now let's talk a little bit more about water's particular properties. The first one that we need to know is called cohesion. Okay, and here's how I remember cohesion. Cohesion sounds a lot like coworkers. So me and the other biology teacher at school, we are coworkers. We have the same job, we're on the same pay level, okay, etc. Me and my boss, well, we're not coworkers. He's my boss. That's a different kind of a relationship. Okay, so co I think of as being the same. Cohesion is when molecules of the same type are attracted to each other. So like water, okay, who is attracted to other water molecules via hydrogen bonding, um, when those two are stuck together, that's what we call cohesion, and it explains lots of things. So first of all, you may notice this bug sitting on top of the water. Well, these water molecules are so highly attracted to each other, they're so cohesive, that the surface of the water can bend without this bug breaking through. That's called surface tension, and it's all due to cohesion. Water also uh, is really important to other organisms, one of which being plants. And plants have a really interesting relationship with water in the fact that they get water from their roots, but that water needs to make its way all the way up to the leaves and such. And for some trees, that can be hundreds of feet tall. So how does that work, right? Plants don't have muscles. They can't push that up there. Well, they rely on another force, which we're gonna to get to in a moment, but that force also relies on cohesion, right? Because when that water is being pulled up here, all of the water molecules need to stick together so they get pulled up as a water column, as a unit. And when I talk about that other property, what I'm really referring to is adhesion. Okay, so adhesion is when two molecules that are different stick to each other. So the big one here that you need to remember is how water moves up plants. So we said that water is attracted to a cell, that's cohesion. But it is also attracted to the sides of the stem. So here's the side of the stem, here's a water molecule, there's an attraction between that water molecule and the side of the stem. So much so that it pulls, it literally pulls that water up through the stem. Okay, keeps pulling it. And of course, because water is also cohesive, this water molecule that's being pulled brings along its friend. Okay, so it can be cohesive and adhesive at the same time. And that's really important because plants have to be able to pull that water up through their stems against the force of gravity. For those of you who are taking higher level, don't worry, we'll talk about this in a lot greater detail. But everyone just needs to remember right now that adhesion okay, is what pulls water up through the stems of plants. Now, water also has some pretty gosh darn cool uh, thermal properties as well. Okay, so I'm going to draw a couple water molecules here. Okay, and remember we've got the positive hydrogen ends and the negative oxygen ends kind of being attracted to each other via a hydrogen bond. All right, great. Now, what do we know about molecules? Well, molecules are always in motion, okay? So these guys, oh, I'm bad at making just those moves, these guys are always in motion. But with them being so highly attracted to each other, that motion is kind of tough. It's tough to get them moving when they're stuck together. And that's what gives water a property known as a high specific heat. Specific heat is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of something. So because water is so highly attracted to other water molecules, it's really hard to get them moving. You have to put in a lot of energy to get them moving enough to raise the temperature. So that means that water can absorb lots of heat energy before it becomes too hot. It also means that it takes a long time uh, for that water to cool down. So why is this important? Well, a couple of reasons here. First of all, 
When your cells undergo metabolic reactions, a lot of times heat is a byproduct of that reaction. So what we're looking at here is cellular respiration where we're taking glucose and in the presence of oxygen, we are kind of dismantling glucose, taking apart those chemical bonds, and we are turning that into carbon dioxide and water, and we're using some of the energy from those bonds that we broke to generate ATP. That's not 100% efficient though. That process also releases heat. Well, it's a good thing that our cells are made mostly up of water. Like I know we have organelles and stuff in here, but the cytoplasm in here is made mostly up of water. And that water can absorb a lot of that heat without really changing the temperature too much. Okay, so it's kind of nice that our cells aren't boiling away. Another great example here is sweat on the skin. So moisture on your skin can absorb a lot of heat energy before it evaporates. And so if the water in the sweat is absorbing that heat energy, then the rest of the body cools down. And humans aren't actually the only ones that do that, okay? Other animals can sweat, but plants also have a very similar process. They have these tiny little holes in their leaves called stomata. And water can actually leave that stomata and evaporate, carrying a bunch of heat with it. So it's a good way for leaves to cool down. I'm also thinking about aquatic organisms. Okay, Most organisms can't sustain life if their uh, environment changes temperatures rapidly. Okay, So it's nice that their environment kind of um, doesn't respond to outside air changes as uh, easily as the air does, okay? So it can kind of hold steady at a temperature for longer than the air, especially important for those sensitive aquatic organisms. Okay, so we know that water's ability to form hydrogen bonds is super important for cohesion, adhesion, and its thermal properties. But it's really water's polarity that makes it a super awesome solvent, okay? So solvent meaning that it's able to dissolve a lot of things. Almost all the metabolic, metabolic reactions that take place in your cell have to take place with those reactants being dissolved in an aqueous solution. So it's kind of nice that a lot of our cellular liquids are made up primarily of water. So here's how water dissolves something. Okay, we're looking at a, a couple molecules of salt here. Water can literally separate molecules and surround them. Okay, so notice these negative oxygens kind of surrounding these positive sodium ions. Notice the positive hydrogen ends surrounding these negative chloride ions. The fact that water kind of surrounds them, okay, keeps these from joining back together. Water is kind of like chaperones at the homecoming dance. Okay, we surround people that are too attracted to each other and we prevent them from getting back together. And so that's what keeps them dissolved in solution. All right, so over here I'm looking at a great example of this. So this is the sodium potassium pump, which is important to a lot of cells, but I'm thinking specifically of your nerve cells. We'll learn a lot more about this later on in the year. Okay, in order to um, create a nervous signal, Nerve cells have to pump out sodium ions from their cell and create a very high concentration gradient. Well, in order for this to happen, the sodium can't be attached to other molecules. It needs to be dissolved in solution. So what do you know? The fluid that makes up the inside of the cell and the extracellular fluid are both primarily made up of water. Okay, so that we can keep those solutes in solution and they can be an important part of metabolic reactions. All right, so it's probably a good idea to know um, a few ex specific examples of how these solvent properties are helpful in actual real-life examples. Great, so one of those solutions that I keep referring to is your cell's cytoplasm. Technically, the definition is the area outside of the nucleus but inside the membrane not including the organelles. So here it's all of this orangey stuff surrounding the organelles. 
and some common reactions that take place there, um, protein synthesis, which we'll all cover later on, and glycolysis, same thing. So for any of you taking standard level, this is what glycolysis is, and you don't have to know that. For my friends in higher level, you're going to see this in your dreams. We're going to talk about that so much. Um, but in order for the mitochondria to kind of really finish off that process of aerobic cellular respiration, glycolysis has to take place first. And glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. So all of the necessary materials for that have to be dissolved in, you guessed it, water. Now, the cytoplasm, and here in this picture that would be yellow, okay? The cytoplasm isn't the only uh, place where we're going to find an aqueous solution in a cell. Sometimes they're inside organelles. Mitochondria have their own fluid. We'll talk about those later, but right now I want to talk to you about the stroma. And the stroma is inside the chloroplast. So here we're looking at an electron micrograph of a chloroplast, and it's filled with these stacks of thylakoid discs called grana. You can see them in here. Okay, they're those little tiny stacks of discs. But the chloroplast is more than just those stacks of discs. So if I'm looking at a chloroplast, it's going to have those thylakoid discs, those grana. And it's also going to have a jelly-like substance called the stroma. And that's where the light independent reactions, aka Calvin cycle, happen. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Just jot it down. Remember it. When you're going back to read these notes, when you're getting ready for your IV exam, trust me, it'll make a lot more sense. All right, one of my favorite aqueous solutions to talk about is the blood plasma because blood is ridiculously cool. Your blood is both a solution and a suspension, okay? So it's a suspension in the fact that your blood is actually made up of a liquid called plasma with a bunch of undissolved things like your white and red blood cells floating around in it. So that's what makes it a suspension. What makes it a solution is that your blood plasma has a lot of solutes dissolved in it. I'm talking proteins, glucose, uh, antibodies, all kinds of things are dissolved in your blood plasma, including carbon dioxide and oxygen. So it's important for oxygen to be able to diffuse into your blood vessels through the plasma in order to get to the red blood cells. And so again, when we talk about example of how water acts as a solvent in plants and animals, we would definitely wanna talk about blood plasma carrying a bunch of things uh, to different parts of the body. So some of the things that I can dissolve into blood plasma include glucose, amino acids, fibrinogen, you don't know what that is now, but you will in May when you take your exam, so just write it down for the moment. It helps with blood clotting. And hydrogen carbonate, carbonate ions. Okay, higher level friends, you'll know what that is too by the end. My point is that this blood plasma has a lot of crap dissolved in it. Plants also have to transport things. They don't have blood, okay, but they have, they have another transport system and one of the ones that covers dissolved things is the phloem. So plants have two types of tubey things in their stem. They have the xylem, which carries water. We already talked about that. And the phloem. And the phloem carries dissolved nutrients and other substances throughout the plant. So things like sugars or minerals okay, are going to be dissolved in solution and moving throughout that plant. Okay, now not everything loves to dissolve, okay? So we have a couple words to kind of compare and contrast um, things that like to dissolve and things that don't. And those are our hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Okay, so we have water-loving, philic means to love, okay, water-loving substances, and those are generally polar molecules, okay? Either polar molecules or ions, Okay, what do polar molecules and ions have in common? Well, they have charges, 
okay? So things that have charges tend to be soluble. Uh, examples here include carbohydrates, okay? This, you should know what this is. This is your friend glucose, okay? These little OH groups here are polar, okay? And because they're polar, the uh, uh, water molecules, which are also polar, are attracted to it. And so this water kind of surrounds it and dissolves it into solution. Now, on the other hand, we have hydrophobic or water-fearing substances. And these are generally nonpolar molecules. They are not uh, anything to do with positive or negative charges. And they tend to be insoluble. So this includes things like fatty acid and methane. Methane uh, is formed by carbon making four nonpolar covalent bonds with hydrogen. Okay, so this results in an overall neutral molecule, nonpolar, and it does not get along with water. It does not attract it to water. Now, we do seem to have some substances that have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts, and those are called amphipathic. Okay, I remember this by thinking about amphibians, and ampha means both. Okay, so amphibians spend part of their life in the water and part of their life cycle on land. So they are in both aquatic and terrestrial environments. Amphipathic molecules are molecules that again have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts. Well, how does that work with proteins? Okay, well, we're gonna find out later in another chapter that proteins are actually long strings of monomers called amino acids. You may remember that from your first biology class. And these amino acids um, have things called R groups. R groups are kind of what makes each amino acid different. Okay, so it's the part of their structure that uh, has like different attachments that you can put onto it. Some of those R groups are polar. That means they're going to love water and they're going to dissolve easily in water. Some R groups are nonpolar. They're not going to like water. So since proteins are made up of long chains of these amino acids, it's likely that some of the amino acids that are in there are going to love water, and some of the amino acids in there are going to hate water. I'm thinking particularly of the proteins in our cell membranes. So here's a great example of an integral protein. It spans the entire cell membrane from outside to inside. Some parts of this are going to be water loving. The parts that are kind of hanging out here in the hydrophilic regions with these hydrophilic heads are probably made out of amino acids that are polar and water loving. The parts that are hanging out here with these hydrophobic tails are probably made mostly up of amino acids that are hydrophobic, water fearing. Okay, and that's how they're getting so along so well with the parts of the membrane that they're kind of stuck in between. So what does all this solubility stuff uh, mean for living organisms? Well, it means that we're going to have to carry different substances in different ways. So the question is, how does solubility affect the transport of molecule in organisms? And I'm going to talk specifically about blood. So there are several things that the tissues and our cells need that are carried by blood. And how they're carried depends on their solubility, right? So one molecule here is glucose. Glucose is a polar molecule. And since it's polar, it's really soluble. So it can dissolve directly in the blood plasma since the blood plasma is primarily made up of water. So that all works pretty good. In our blood plasma, I'm going to find a lot of glucose. All right, one of the other things that I find a lot dissolved in the blood plasma are these amino acids. And again, some amino acids uh, are polar and some aren't. So the polar ones are going to dissolve really easily. 
The nonpolar ones still dissolve because amino acids have several pieces and parts to them. Uh, they just don't dissolve as easily as the ones who are polar all the way around. Okay, and again, these are going to dissolve directly in the blood plasma. So I would find them in the plasma of the blood cells. That doesn't make any sense. I would find them in the plasma of your blood. Okay, so one of the things that us old people have to get checked pretty often is our cholesterol. And how do we get our cholesterol checked? Well, they draw blood. Okay, so that tells me that their cholesterol, our cholesterol has to be carried by our blood. That's interesting because cholesterol is a nonpolar molecule, okay? Meaning that it is not soluble in the blood plasma. So how is it floating around in our blood? Well, it's transported by blood proteins. So again, proteins are made up of strings of amino acids. Some are going to be polar, some are going to be nonpolar. The cholesterol is going to attach itself to some of the nonpolar amino acids because it's nonpolar and it gets along well with other nonpolar things. Once that uh, cholesterol is attached to one of the nonpolar amino acids on this protein strand, then this protein can dissolve, well, parts of it can dissolve into the blood plasma and be carried around to the different tissues and cells. And that works the same way uh, with fats. So fats and cholesterol have a lot of the same properties. Okay, They're also both nonpolar non-soluble and they are also transported by those blood proteins and they're specifically held on to by those non-polar amino acid parts of the protein. Okay, next comes oxygen. Oxygen is a really tricky cat, okay? Oxygen in its molecular form, this form, is non-polar and it has a relatively low solubility. Now, its solubility increases when the temperature drops. So that's why we find a lot of really cool marine life in the cold water currents because cold water dissolves more oxygen, which means that there can be more zooplankton and other small uh, food items for lovely marine organisms, okay? Now, the problem is, is that our bodies uh, don't exist in cold water currents. Our bodies are hot, okay? Blood is about 37 degrees Celsius, okay? Or if you're still holding on to hope that we're going to switch to Fahrenheit, 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not right. Why didn't anybody correct me there? <laughs> 98.6. See, this is why we should use metric, okay? All right, so some oxygen can dissolve in your blood plasma, but not nearly enough to fulfill the requirements of your cells. So your blood has floating around in it these red blood cells. And these red blood cells have this really cool protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has spots on it where oxygen can attach. Okay, so oxygen attaches to hemoglobin, which is part of your red blood cells, which then floats around in your blood and is carried to different tissues in your body. And the last one we're going to talk about is sodium chloride, which is the fancy pants word for salt. Okay, we need sodium and chlorine for a lot of processes. Okay, so it's really important that that's in our blood plasma. I'm not asking you to go and eat a container full of salt. I'm pretty sure the food you eat has plenty in there. I'm just saying we need some salt dissolved into our blood plasma. And that's pretty easy because sodium chloride is a compound held together with an ionic bond, meaning that it's made of ions. And ions are charged. Charged things are very soluble. So it dissolves directly in the blood plasma. And I know this because our kidneys filter out that plasma pretty regularly. And some of that salt comes out in the waste product from our kidneys known as urine. All 
All right, just to wrap up here, uh, we've been talking a lot about water. So why isn't water necessary? That's the necessary component for life and not other things like, let's say, methane, okay? Because methane is made up of carbon and hydrogen. Those are pretty abundant materials on Earth. So why can't we use methane as the medium for life instead of water? Well, let's take a look at their structures. Water is formed through covalent and particularly polar covalent bonding. So that's going to give each end either a positive or negative charge. Methane is formed through nonpolar covalent bondings. So no covalent bonds. And the reason why this is important is because the hydrogen bonds that exist to hold water molecules together don't exist to hold methane molecules together. They're not attracted to each other because they don't have any charges. So remember, these hydrogen bonds cause water to kind of resist changes in temperature. It has a high specific heat and water boils. Holy crap, there's an error here, a typo, wow. Pure water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so 100 degrees Celsius. Methane, on the other hand, changes temperature really easily. There's no hydrogen bond to connect these. They respond with motion very easily to changes in temperature. And they boil at a minus 162 degrees Celsius. So in other words, they go from liquid to gas form at really cold temperatures. There's not a lot to hold them in their liquid form. So kind of a couple of differences uh, between those two and why we generally look for water as being the medium for life. And that is the end of chapter 2.2 on water.